Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. All crazy martinis to close out your week. So get ready for that. Crazy, crazy, crazy across the board. And Jim, it's just felt like a long week. I feel like there's been about 19 days in this week, but uh, apparently I'm told there's only been the normal number. We're on day six. But uh, let's go to our first crazy martini, which is also a really bad one. Uh, this is from your colleague Zachary Evans at National Review Online. 41% of Baltimore public high school students held a grade point average of less than 1.0 during the first three quarters of the 2020 2021 school year, Baltimore local Fox 45 News reported on Monday. This means that nearly half of Baltimore's 20,500 public high school students earned less than a D average for most of the year. Meanwhile, 21% of high school students received a GPA above 3.0, according to a chart showing grading averages obtained by the station's Project Baltimore investigation. The number of students earning less than a one point almost doubled from the previous school year when 24% of high schoolers recorded a D average during the second quarter. And so, Jim, you can chalk this up to a couple of different things. Number one, inner city schools are often not very good, and it would appear Baltimore is no exception. And, of course, uh, for this past school year, a lot of them were distance learning. And as we know, uh, that turned into a train wreck in a lot of areas, not just in the cities. So uh, what are our big takeaways from this alarming number? It's terrible news, Greg, but there is some good news. I understand the former mayor has a book encouraging people, kids to read. <laughs> and uh, that's going to work. That's, yeah. For those who don't recall, the former mayor ended up, uh, I believe, resigning because of the cities choosing to you know, purchase massive amounts of her really ridiculous children's book that she had scribbled off rather quickly. The, the yeah, what you point out, like, look, you know, America has a lot of cities that have big problems. If Baltimore isn't the worst hit out of all of them, maybe Detroit, maybe Camden, uh, maybe someplace in California you can point to. But by and large, you know, you know Baltimore's got all kinds of problems. I think what's particularly troublesome about this is, you know, besides the fact that, like this isn't just, you know, a portion of the students, like, like people who um, are really, really concerned about their parents' education and who can afford to send their kids to private schools in, in Baltimore and in most of these jurisdictions. So the kids who are left are the ones who do not have parents of means, are the ones who can to kids who don't have parents who are paying as much attention to their uh, uh, children's education, you know, heading into this pandemic environment, you know, Baltimore City Schools faced a lot of challenges and the kids going to these schools faced a lot of challenges that were not going to be easily overcome. Pandemic makes things even worse. Teachers are not having face-to-face -face interaction with their kids anymore. Kids are not in school. They're not their peers. They're not in that environment that is, you know, a uh, certain amount of discipline and focus and kind of helping them learn stuff. But I think one of the things that, you know, kind of a little further down in the story, you notice, uh, Baltimore schools began opening for in-person learning late February, early March of 2021. And there are you know, like, there's very few schools were going, all right, we're back five days a week, back to normal. Most of these school districts were rather gradual. But the fact that this many people um, you know, were, were basically failing, basically, you know, grade point average of less than 1.0, um, 21%, by the way, were above 3.0. That's a B. I'm familiar with that part uh, from my academic career. Um, really kind of indicates there's, there's no quick fix. This was not simply a problem of, oh, well, they're out of class. Uh, they're, they're trying to learn from home. The internet connections are spotty or the tech isn't working or uh, a lot of distractions in their home. Like, you know, you, you could blame the pandemic. You could blame distance learning. And I think we can and should. But that's not simply the problem. There was not, there's nothing in there that says, oh, but as soon as the kids started coming back, things improved, um, which is really, really unnerving. If the pandemic hurt kids' education, and I really don't think that's a controversial statement anymore, I think the idea of, ah, oh, you know, it was really bad, but they'll bounce back, you know, we'll rebound, we'll be back to normal pretty soon. There's a lot of lost ground. And I think it's going to be a long, slow slog to make up that lost ground. Um, now, again, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, harp on the usual partisan point. But again, when, when people across the country look at this and say, oh my God, how can this happen in Baltimore? You can't blame the Baltimore Republican Party. 
I, you know, I believe the Baltimore Republican Party holds its conventions in a phone booth. There just aren't that many of them. It is a heavily Democratic city with heavily Democratic, you know, uh, city councilmen and aldermen and uh, uh, mayors and, you know, all, all up through all the way up to Governor Larry Hogan. In fact, if you talk to people who know Maryland politics, they will point out that one of the reasons Larry Hogan was able to win, uh, I guess we're coming up on seven years ago, was this frustration by Democrats outside of Baltimore. You probably remember the Baltimore riots. You probably remember the mayor who's like, we, we gave them space to be destructive and didn't want to confront the rioters. And of course, the damage was even worse. And there are various folks who will tell you downtown Baltimore uh, never quite recovered. Uh, you know, the, the National Aquarium, Camden Yards, that little core area still brings people in. But there are large chunks of the city that just never quite economically came back. It was a real damage to the, the image of the city. And this was a city that had a whole heap of problems, uh, you know, heading into this. The, you know, there are Democrats outside of Baltimore are fed up with Baltimore Democrats. And this further indicator, I kind of wonder if you could have a situation kind of like New Orleans uh, in Louisiana, where, where Bobby Jindal was governor after Katrina, it was so bad. The state court, Supreme Court agreed, OK, city government, you are no longer in, in charge of the city schools. State, come in and take over, see what you can do. And the good news is there was some improvement. I don't want to say it was a miracle, but I think some signs of significant improvement for some schools in the city of New Orleans. Maybe something like that is you know, long overdue in Baltimore. Jim, yeah, Baltimore has been a mess for a, a very long time for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, drug issues, crime issues. Um, I mean, I'm probably up there a couple times a year and just uh, you get a couple of blocks off the Inner Harbor and it's it's not good. And uh, when you've got a school system like this, the odds of things uh, improving in any significant way anytime soon are not good either. Just very, very depressing. Um, and, and even though the numbers are worse, probably because of the distance learning, it's it's still very, very, very bad. But I do have some good news uh, for you, Jim, and for our listeners, of course, and that is that you can protect yourself. And I'm talking about online. Look, you've got these free email services like Gmail and Yahoo, but they aren't really free because the reason you don't pay anything is because you're the product. You pay with your privacy, and those companies have access to every email you send and receive. And social media is the same way, too. Uh, you are the product. And so uh, you've seen stories about uh, major credit uh, rating agencies getting hacked, the, the government, uh, people's medical records getting out there. It's just a mess. But you can trust StartMail to secure your email, and it'll help you feel safe online again, because StartMail keeps your email private, period. Every email is encrypted, even if the recipient doesn't use encryption. That means big tech can't read, scan, analyze, or sell your personal information ever. With StartMail, deleted means deleted. When you delete an email, poof, it is gone forever. And StartMail uses their own servers, not Amazon's, which means they can't be put out of business like Parler. StartMail is also backed by the most stringent privacy laws in the world. You get unlimited anonymous aliases. This feature protects your main email address from spam and phishing attacks. So when you're giving your email to a company, but you want to protect your identity, StartMail can generate a shareable alias email so people can't sell your information and they can be deleted anytime. So don't trust big tech. They've given you plenty of reasons not to. Start securing your email privacy with StartMail. Sign up today and you'll get 50% off your first year. Go to startmail.com slash martini. That's startmail with a T, two of them actually, S-T-A-R-T, mail.com slash martini for 50% off your first year. Startmail.com slash martini. All right, Jim, the government's intrusion, interesting transition there from that ad, uh, seems to be a common topic this week. We were just talking about a Politico story a couple days ago where Biden administration officials were saying, huh, maybe we need to find some uh, fact checkers to intervene on people's texting and social media threads to uh, uh, counter misinformation, particularly as it relates to the vaccine and, and coronavirus information. Now, uh, Jen Psaki, right from the White House podium, admitting that the White House and the government are telling Facebook which posts it finds problematic. Here's a little bit of what Saki had to say. I believe this was just on Thursday. 
In terms of actions, Alex, that uh, we have taken or we're working to take, I should say, from the federal government, uh, we've increased uh, disinformation research and tracking uh, within the Surgeon General's office. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook uh, that spread disinformation. We're working with doctors and medical professionals to connect uh, to connected medical experts with popular with popular who are popular with their audiences with uh, with accurate information and boost trusted content. So we're helping get trusted content out there. They're flagging posts for Facebook, essentially saying, hey, Facebook, you might want to slap a warning or a clarification on this one. Jim, is there any place we can communicate where the government's not snooping around? Yeah, look, this is this is really bad. Uh, my colleague Phil Klein had a good corner post yesterday laying out that this step, you know, it's, it doesn't sound like much. Sounds pretty innocuous. Oh, yeah, okay, the, the Biden administration and uh, Surgeon General's office are reaching out to Facebook and saying, these posts are disinformation, you should take them down. It sounds, oh, okay, that's just, you know, you know, stopping false information from spreading around. Unfortunately, that's not really part of the Surgeon General's job. And we, we've been in the middle of this continuing argument about whether big tech is having far too much power over the terms of debate and what can be said and what can't be said in American life. And I won't give you the, the whole spiel, but you know, when Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all of these you know, social media companies came along, their argument was, we give your voice to the world. We're not the New York Times. We don't pick and choose what we think is worthwhile to be brought to an audience. We let the audience decide. We let anybody set up account and say whatever they want and let them organize, you know, build their audiences and stuff like that. Then once really horrible people started putting stuff up there, they, you know, they go, oh, wait, oh, we don't want to have that Holocaust deniers. Geez Louise, we don't want that. And it's very understandable that they reach that point. But all of a sudden they kind of steps closer and closer to becoming a media company. And now all of a sudden they do recognize they have to decide what's acceptable and what's not. And that's going to generate tensions. A lot of people who feel like what they're saying isn't all that controversial uh, is getting taken down and, and things like that. With this one, we've had this argument going around for a very long time. People say, Facebook is censoring me. And they people say, look, Facebook is a private company. There's no, the, the, this isn't government censorship. Facebook can decide what it wants to post and what it doesn't want to post. Well, wait a second. If the US government is calling up Facebook and saying that post is disinformation, you should take it down. And Facebook does take it down. The argument, oh, they're a private company, they can do whatever they want, suddenly gets a whole lot weaker. Yeah, you know, maybe it's not an explicit order from the government. There's not necessarily a power of, you know, the government saying, you know, Facebook, take down that post or uh, we will use the force of law to shut you down. But at this point, distinguishing between the private sector and the public sector uh, starts getting very blurry. And the idea of where does business stop and where does government edicts begin becomes a very blurry line. And of course, Greg, let's just pause to note the irony. These are people who believe their opponents are fascists. Uh, of course, one of the whole race of factors was that businesses did what the state required. That ultimately, you know, yeah, you could have a private company in Nazi Germany, but in the end, you were doing what the, the regime demanded you to do and things like that. Um, so look, I, you know, am I saying this is fascism? I'm saying this is taking another step during a, during down a road we don't like. And this is recognizing that it's entirely possible that every single one of these posts that the government wants to take down is absolute garbage nonsense, that it's spreading a lie, and that nobody in the world should be posting that stuff or be spreading that stuff. That said, once government and business get together into this, we're dealing with something potentially very dangerous. And I think, look, Facebook doesn't ask me for advice. But if I were Zuckerberg right now, I would look at their lists of posts that the U.S. government wants to take down. And I would find whichever post was most defensible, whichever one is in a gray area, whichever one is not necessarily disinformation, and basically say very loudly and publicly, no, I will not take that post down. I don't work for you. You're not the boss of me. You do not have any authority over deciding what goes on Facebook. These other ones, yeah, okay, I think they're not worthy of Facebook standards. I, I'm worried about those posts, and I think they should come down. But this one, no. And at that, at that point, you could, Facebook could at least more plausibly argue that they are no, not becoming an extension of the government or uh, uh, the government is now not controlling what's being said. By the way, this is interesting that this story came along right before Saki said this. Um, there's this institution called the Aspen Institute, and they hold the Aspen Ideas Festival uh, every summer. And they're kind of, the, they're almost like the Davos Summit in, in winter. They're, they're this big get together of movers and shakers, public sector, government officials, a mix of some celebrities. And they all get together in Aspen and talk about how wonderful their ideas are and all kinds of stuff. So they created 
something called a commission on information disorder. And, you know, it's the usual complaints about disinformation being spread through social media and loss of faith and authority of uh, government officials and yada, yada, yada. Now, I, I wrote yesterday, I wrote about some of the folks, Katie Couric's on it. I'll, I'll pause. I'll give you a moment to groan. <laughs> uh, um, Prince Harry is on it. And Greg, it seems kind of odd that in the month of July, of all the times of the year, right around July is when I don't want a be- member of the British royal family telling Americans what they can say and what they can't say. Amen. Fairly certain we were we, we established, you know, these sorts of things. But the other thing, you know, uh, Congressman Will, Will Hurd, or former Congressman Will Hurd is on this. I, I generally like him. I'm not fond to see him doing this. But the thing that kind of jumps out at me, it really kind of bugs me. Uh, Aaron Ford, the current Nevada Attorney General, is on this. And I kind of, I'm like, you know, I don't want current government officials who have the authority, which should be effectively the chief law enforcement officer of the state of Nevada, uh, someone who has the man to prosecute people. I don't think I want them on this, um, to specifically since the Commission on Information Disorder is very specifically about what should Americans not be allowed to say, not be allowed to post, not be allowed to share with their neighbors because it is disinformation. And I think we're going down a very dangerous road here. So uh, very little, no, no real good news from this, I think. If you're looking for a silver lining, I think the way Jen Psaki and the rest of them are talking about it, they're completely oblivious to the kind of backlash that they are courting by merging government and big tech, deciding what can and can't be posted on social media. Ugh. And there doesn't seem to be much blowback on this. Uh, I mean, I've seen it a, a few Not places yet. on it social just media. Yesterday, Greg, give it time. <laughs> I think if Sarah Huckabee Sanders had said something like this or uh, mm. McEnany or whoever the press secretary would have been for Trump at the time, I'm guessing there might have been a little more scrutiny and concern uh, from our media. But mm. because they're, you know, all wearing the same team colors, we uh, we don't have any sort of uh, calling of account and uh, and protecting people's rights on this. But uh, what else is new? At least you can sleep well. If you can get to sleep. And uh, that's where my pillow comes in. Fantastic pillows, of course. But they also give the same careful attention to their Giza Dream Sheets. We've been talking about the Giza Dream Sheets for a couple of weeks now. Super comfortable, super soft, fantastic cotton, uh, and definitely the preferred sheets uh, in our house. Uh, like I've said many times already, as soon as they uh, have to go in the wash, it's that same day we're putting them back on the bed. And so it's uh, clear that these are the best sheets that we've got. And I think you'll probably agree. Their current offer is that for a limited time, you can get two sets of the Giza Dream Sheets for one low price, plus free shipping. Imagine sliding into the most comfortable sheets you will ever own, guaranteed. They're made from the world's best cotton, grown only in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. Its long staple cotton makes it ultra soft and breathable. These sheets are available in a variety of colors and sizes. They're machine washable, And they have a 60-day money-back guarantee, plus a one-year limited warranty. So visit MyPillow.com and use the promo code MARTINI at checkout. Or call 800-874-0104 for two sets of Giza Dream Sheets for one low price, plus free shipping. Again, that's two sets of Giza Dream Sheets for one low price, plus the free shipping with the promo code MARTINI. You can do that at MyPillow.com or when you call 800-874-0104. So sleep better with MyPillow.com or call 800 874-0104. All right, Jim, I believe that you and Chad talked about this next story to some extent while I was on vacation, but there seems to be more evidence of the problem, and that is that a lot of people who you would think are pretty much in ideological lockstep with Kamala Harris are terrified that she could actually be president of the United States, whether it's due to a health issue with Biden or that she's just poised to be the nominee, perhaps, in 2024 if uh, if Biden can't run for re-election. But either way, she's the vice president. She's obviously going to be a significant factor in upcoming elections. But um, the insider uh, has reported now it's a nightmare scenario for some former Harris staffers who watched nervously as their former boss ascended the national political stage. Many of them remain loyal Democrats and fans of Biden, but they did not want to see a boss with whom they'd had a bad experience become the Democratic Party's standard bearer. Biden, at 78, was already the oldest person to assume the U.S. presidency. He'll be a few weeks shy of his 82nd birthday on Election Day 2024, and there's already speculation six months into this term over whether he'll run for 
re-election. And so there's a, a lot of different people who talk to Politico and elsewhere. Uh, they say that uh, a President Harris is a terrifying prospect, again, for far lefties who recall a toxic and reactionary workplace infused with a sense of paranoia in that office that you never knew when she was going to snap at you. One former staffer who had mostly positive things to say about Harris conceded that her staffers were often so stressed out that they were making themselves sick. Is that toxic? I don't know. Uh, and then uh, this is all uh, aggregated by Andrew Stiles over at uh, Free Beacon. He also says uh, from the Politico story that ran on this, the comments from former staffers echo those published earlier this month in Politico. People are thrown under the bus from the very top. There are short fuses, and it's an abusive environment. It's not a healthy environment, and people often feel mistreated. It's not a place where people feel supported, but a place where people feel treated like crap, uh, to, to put a translation on that. Their accounts described Harris as an unpredictable boss who would unleash a lot of verbal abuse upon staffers who failed to fulfill her erratic demands or even for handing her the wrong type of pen. The traumatic work environment could explain why Harris had one of the highest staff turnover rates among U.S. Senators between 2017 and 2020. Jim, this would have been really good to know about before. I don't know if that would have changed a lot of people's presidential votes. But when the people in your own party are terrified of you uh, accumulating more power, that's a red flag. Indeed, Greg. I and mean, look, when you hear these kinds of stories, there was one about uh, Kirsten Cinema uh, recently, and it talked about how much abuse the people in her office get from callers who call into the office who are very upset with her stance on the filibuster and things like that. Of course, that's not Cinema's fault. That's that's the that's the irate lefties who are or mean and obnoxious and verbally abusive and get off on screaming at interns. Um, that's not you know Kirsten Cinema. Like the, the implication was well because of this, Kirsten Cinema should change her position. No, that's not the way it works. But I think that when you hear these kinds of stories of the staff don't like working for her, well, okay, maybe that reflects genuine problems. Maybe it reflects people who are, uh, I mean, it could be reflect a demanding boss. It could reflect somebody who uh, has high expectations and demands the best of people and doesn't allow people to slack. And, and this causes tension. Also, sometimes it's the, uh, my former boss didn't listen to me enough. Uh, and thus, uh, this, this is why they're flawed people or something. However, these anecdotes are indeed starting to pile up about Harris. And I think when, you know, the way to measure these kinds of stories is, okay, when you look at this politician and how they go about their job, how they, how they go about their um, achieving their goals and stuff like that, does it seem like a, a well-oiled machine? Does it seem like a smooth running operation where everybody knows what they're, what they're supposed to do and does it well? Uh, that's not the case. And I think you can, you know, probably the most you know, glaring example of this was the presidential campaign, where it sounds like um, the reason you, you would see Kamala Harris uh, contradicting herself on whether she wanted to eliminate private insurance uh, or various other stances is because she would just kind of change her mind from now, from time to time. And she didn't really know what she believed. She didn't really know what she wanted to do, that she would think one was a good idea and then put it out there and announce it to great fanfare and then get pushed back. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, God, I didn't want to do that. I you know, and backtrack and then insist that, no, actually, no, she didn't want to get rid of private insurance. Unfortunately, that's you know, and, and of course, when a politician doesn't have that, you could call it character, you could call it spine. Um, I don't even really think necessarily it's uh, it's necessarily that. My boss once made an anecdote about Rick Santorum, who's not my favorite politician, but who I think he made the observation that Rick Santorum like really got into the nuts and bolts of policy, really got into the details, and it spent so much time um, researching and just working on issues so that when he was asked on a debate for two minutes, you know, offer your views on something, he could explain it clearly and concisely. He knew what he believed, he knew what he wanted to do, and there really wasn't any hesitation or how do I calibrate this to appeal to this demographic or, or something like that. I think with Kamala Harris, what we see here is that certain amount of um, fuzziness on the details and knowing she, knowing she wants to be popular, knowing she wants to be uh, in the next most powerful position, she wants to appeal to a lot of people but doesn't really know how to do it and inevitably ends up, you know, uh, back into corners and starts insisting, well, I haven't been to Europe either and all these other uh, moments in interviews that have not gone well. And if you have those, those kind of overall fuzziness, that overall lack of decisiveness, that um, yearning to be liked and kind of fear of being criticized, but also 
uh, you know, not this, the, all of this adds up to kind of contradictory desires, which is why your staff can start to find you erratic and kind of feel like, look, I want to help you, boss, but I need to know how to do it. And I need to know what it is exactly you want so that I can act out that plan. If you're changing the plan every five minutes, I can't really get results. That strikes me as what seems like what's at work here. Um, and I think speaking as someone who's been very, very critical of Kamala Harris since she appeared at the national scene, if I were forced to say something nice about her, which, you know, I assume you've got someone has some sort of leverage over me, forcing me to do this, but yeah. But if I had to, I think I'd say, you look at her and her entire career, she does have exactly what you'd want to see in a San Francisco prosecutor, in a San Francisco district attorney. She was, you know, elected and reelected in that job and also had accumulated a pretty darn good record in that, regardless of other things that may have been going on in her life at that time and earlier in her career. Every subsequent step higher on the ladder has taken her away from that environment, that arguing in front of a jury, that she's apparently what she's really good at, and puts her into, you know, that this prosecutorial skill set doesn't always work well when you're a senator, when you're a presidential candidate, or when you're the vice president and you're getting all the dirty jobs that the president doesn't want to deal with. So that's where we are with this. And I think that's the fundamental problem is that she's um, I don't want to say a square peg in a round hole or, or however, you know, whatever metaphor, she doesn't really fit what, you know, she, she, in the end, she wasn't really a good choice for this job. She's not great at being, um, doing the dirty work. And you can already hear the complaining and that comment in that interview earlier in the week where she said, I need to get better at saying no and all of that stuff. Look, she didn't want to be Joe Biden's sidekick, right? She went to yeah, the first debate. She went out to clobber him. He was the old guard that she was supposed to replace. And there was just this little nagging flaw that Democratic primary voters weren't interested in that. And she's got to adjust to this tough decision. And I don't know if she'll ever adjust to it. But the idea that all of this adds up to someone who runs something of a chaotic office, who's constantly taking it out of the staff, doesn't exactly shock me, Greg. So basically, you're saying her only political talent uh, was for a job she doesn't have anymore. Uh, so, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Be- be- if she ever becomes president and we totally need to convince a jury of San Franciscans, she'll be in the right place. <laughs> I can only imagine Amy Klobuchar reading this story and going, man, that office is messed <laughs> up. It wasn't about prosecutors, yeah. man. She was a prosecutor, too. These people are not not good to their she own She went staffers. a lot further than Harris did. So, yeah. Well, she, yeah, she did in the campaign. But, I mean, what is it about how prosecutors treat their staffers? I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush here, but that was uh, – that was Klobuchar's job in uh, Minneapolis and, and and that sort of thing. So uh, anyway, she's just the uh, the gift that keeps on giving to the right, which was probably not the uh, intention of the Biden campaign. But uh, anyway, we'll take it for now. Jim, talk to you on Monday. Actually, no, you're off on vacation. I will talk to you a week from Monday. I am out next week. So I don't know whether it's Rob Long or whichever one of my colleagues you managed to grab by the collar and drag into the <laughs> studio. But uh I'm sure they love it. I'm sure you'll have a good good time next week. And everyone, enjoy. I will be back a week from Monday. Fantastic. Enjoy the time with your family and enjoy getting out of Dodge for a few days as well. Uh, he's Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, thank you for subscribing to the Three Martini Lunch. Or do that if you don't already. Tell your friends about us. Thanks for those uh, kind reviews and your five-star ratings. We really appreciate those as well. Get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Uh, Find him on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great weekend. And uh, Jim, have a great vacation. But we'll be here on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch. We are living in difficult times where people fear having thought-provoking conversations about pressing issues. And although we're in the midst of an information explosion, there are a lot of forces aiming to distort what's true. I created The Bill Walton Show to provide a forum for in-depth, thought-provoking conversations with leaders, artists, entrepreneurs, and thinkers. Please join me at thebillwaltonshow.com to explore what's true, what's right, and what's next.